It's Jesse that's setting up. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, this is Carla McNeil from Learning Matters. Huge Happy New Year to all of our followers. It is my absolute pleasure to be joined by Dr. Carol Tolman this morning, um, all the way from the United States. Uh, good morning, Carol. It's not quite good morning for you. It's looking like it's good evening looking behind you through your window. <laughs> it is good evening, but thank you and good morning, Carla. Today it's still Wednesday here. Um, so. Um, yep, it's the evening, but I'm very excited to be here, regardless of the day or time. Yeah, it's great to have you with us. So um, before we've come on screen, we've just been um, having a bit of a catch up about the state of the nation and where you're up to uh, in terms of um, whether you're in lockdown or out of lockdown. I think it's um, really nice if you could just share with everybody because everybody always wants to know what's going on around the world. So if you can just tell us what's happening for you and the people around you, that would be great. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. So I've been in this little space in my room, my office at home since March. So of 2020, um, I used to fly every single week. I'd fly out on Monday, come back on Friday. And all of a sudden that came, of course, to a screeching halt. So um, luckily no one in my immediate family or friend, friend circle has been ill, which is great, uh, but we're pretty much home. And I have a very small circle of people that I occasionally see, um, but I'm really here. And we've just turned everything virtual. And I think I've met more people, especially internationally, mm -hmm. than I had before. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> great. I'm so, so pleased to hear that everybody's, everybody's doing okay. And as I mentioned to you, as we kind of stroll the beaches here in New Zealand for our summer, uh, we are really conscious of how fortunate we are and what's going on um, internationally. It, it sort of feels like we've all become one really big family, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's just, yeah, it's, um, such well, unusual the time. Really small. The world is it very is. small, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're all in this together. That's right. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, Carol, I'd just like to share um, with everybody who's going to be joining us for our chit chat today a little bit about you, and I'm sure you'll fill in the gaps. But I'd like to share with everybody that uh, that Carol is an international uh, literacy expert and consultant. Uh, she is extremely passionate about teacher education. Uh, Carol is the co-author of Letters, which many of you will have heard about before. And for those of you who haven't, Letters is spelt L-E-T-R-S. And I'll pop a link, Carol, later in our comment thread for those who want to um, learn a little bit more. Uh, and you were just telling me before we came uh, on to our chit chat that uh, Letters is uh, currently being rolled out in Australia and um, hopefully in the very near future, will be available in New Zealand and I did mention to you that one of my colleagues is currently uh, participating in the letters training and another deputy principal that I work very closely with has just completed um, her letters training so great to see that that fantastic uh, training is also hitting New Zealand shores and Carol you reside on a 60 acre horse farm can you I tell do. us the exact can you tell us the exact location of where you are well, I'm in New Hampshire, which is sort of the northeastern corner of the United States in the chilly part, the cold part. Um, so it's not very warm, but I am there and um, we have 60 acres, dead end road, middle of nowhere. When it really snows, we have to plow ourselves mm -hmm. out. It's really fun. And it, it's, an, it's a nice um, contrast to the intellectual, passionate, mm. um, nerd life that I absolutely love. If I were strolling the beach, I'd have scientific studies of reading in one hand. Um, as well, it's so <laughs> <laughs> but I love, I love, I love, love it. <laughs> I, 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 I totally get that. I often have um, these headphones in my ears with the scientific studies of reading coming oh. through the headphones in, in various forms of podcasts. And yeah, so um, that's fantastic. So um, our, our sort of um, purpose here at Learning Matters is to inspire, enable and influence um, the education for, for children, particularly those who have learning differences. And so that's why we have this um, uh, desire to reach out to experts such as yourself internationally to help be able to inspire teachers and influence their teaching practice and the development of their knowledge. So we're really grateful here in New Zealand that you've taken the time uh, 
to join us this morning to share with us the great piece of work um, that is uh, the Tolman Hourglass figure. So I'm going to change um, the screens over now because I know you want to share your screen through this process. And if we could please begin um, by you introducing us to the Tolman Hourglass and um, perhaps giving us a little bit of insight into how, how and why this was developed. Sure, thank you for, for the question. Um, this wasn't developed uh, in my mind from an hourglass. It became an hourglass based on the content. And I, my passion is always about trying to find really deep theoretical research that um, truly represents how students read and what happens when they don't read well and when they don't write well. And how can we articulate that for teachers, for parents, for students themselves so that they can use that information. So the hourglass figure was born from the, um, the wish to be able to articulate the different levels of phonological awareness and the different levels of phonics and spelling. So I thought about the idea that when our young infants and toddlers hear language in their environments, they're hearing big, long connected streams of speech. And over time, we help them with understanding slightly smaller and smaller and smaller units of speech until we really get where it matters for an alphabetic system for reading and spelling, the phoneme level. So that's where the top part of the hourglass came from big open to a little bit smaller, see? And then um, we adjusted it, I adjusted it my, and this is the second iteration of the hourglass after actually reading David Kilpatrick's work and talking with, <laughs> with David and I know that he's been with you before mm. um, and thinking through um, early basic and advanced levels of phonological and phonemic awareness. So the whole top part represents that idea of we don't come naturally being aware of segmenting and blending um, and understanding individual phonemes. It's the co-articulated stream of speech that we really hear in our environment. So that's where the top part came from. The bottom portion was almost the re obviously the reverse in that we don't want to teach students chunks like word families or whole syllables when we're teaching the letters and the letter patterns. We need to explain that we have this squiggle on the paper is a letter, a, a grapheme, a letter or a letter pattern that represents a phoneme. And then once we understand and are aware of a phoneme and we can layer the grapheme onto that, we can then start using that information to teach slightly larger and larger and larger chunks, if you will, of phonics and spelling um, patterns. So you wouldn't start right at word family. You would certainly want to know the individual letter sound combination first. And that's kind of where the idea of how it looks from big to small and small to big sort of captured um, and became the hourglass. Mm. So th there's a couple of really key things that I've picked up from what you're saying um, to help translate that for some, because Carol, we in New Zealand, we have some teachers that uh, are really, really well and truly on their way in terms of their knowledge and practice in um, structured literacy and the science of reading. Uh, but we have a very, very large body of um, educators across the country who are just beginning this journey and just beginning to come to that realization that actually there's a lot that we weren't taught in our pre-service teacher training. And so just a couple of um, things that I really picked up. One in particular was, you know, that the importance of us all understanding the need for us to explicitly teach that the letter, the letter pattern, that kind of, I'm gonna say, you know, once we've got to print, that it is incredibly important for us to be teaching explicitly that phoneme to grapheme correspondence at a very, very micro level. Mm -hmm, for sure. So I appreciate that thought. And when I, when I think about that in relationship to the hourglass, I might say, and I'll use my little cursor. Can mm -hmm. you see that, Carla? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, here's, here's something that's a little tweak on, on um, how people may see this that really connects to your idea of being explicit and systematic. We do have early basic and advanced levels of phonological awareness. However, because we're an alphabetic system, the level of the phoneme, phone means is Greek for sound and E-M-E -E is the smallest meaningful unit of something. 
So this or, or the smallest unit of something. So a phoneme is the smallest unit of speech of sound, a speech sound that um, if you add it or change it to a certain word would connect to a different meaning. The difference between i and e in bit and bet, for instance, right, means that those are phonemes that we um, string together. Right here in the early phonological awareness portion, we can begin to get children to be aware of individual sounds by doing activities with what we call onset and rhyme, almost like alliterative language. However, the onset would be explicitly taught where we would ask if I have a word like um, say um, fast and I would say say fast fast what's the first sound or what do you feel and look like in your mouth when you say fast in the very beginning and get children to notice that oh they take their teeth they put it over their bottom lip and they blow out air and by the way there's nothing going on there's no rumbling in your throat when you say that you can get, that's called the onset. It's the beginning consonant sounds in a word and the vowel and everything else that comes after it is the rhyme, the R-I-M-E. You can begin to discuss phonemic awareness by initial sound right there at that mm. early, early level. And that's what you want to do at another time in your day after you've explicitly helped children become aware of those sounds, what they look like, and what they feel like, because in all honesty, Carla, phonemes are articulatory gestures. Mm. How we code them in our brains are by the uh, what happens in our mouths with movement. And we call that place and manner, right, of articulation. So how we move our teeth, our tongue, our lips, what we do with our airflow, what we do with our voicing, whether or not something's through your nose, all matters. That gets coded as a memory trace. So when children are aware at the onset level of an individual sound, uh, consonant phoneme, then you can start working with two sounds. And I wanna show you, here's an example. I just pop this over for a heartbeat here, where I've used the hourglass to say right there, when you get to the basic level, then you can get them aware of one consonant phoneme or a vowel phoneme, and then work with two sounds, three sounds, four sounds, so on and so forth, right? And as soon as you are aware of a sound, a child is aware of a sound and can differentiate it from other phonemes that are similar to them, then at another time in the day, you explicitly teach the name of the letter. So of, of the alphabet, right? We have 26 letters and we're using them sometimes in an arbitrary way to represent 44 phonemes, mm. right? In English language. So it's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence. We use a combination of those 26 letters in, in a very various ways, but in a very structured, systematic way it, with a very tight scope and sequence, we teach the letter names. And that's when you can then hook it into this bottleneck. Mm -hmm. That's what one-to-one -one correspondence is. Here's a letter, this is blue purposely because it connects to the bottom phonics part. As soon as you introduce a letter, it's no longer just phonemic awareness. And this is the orange, the top part because that is the speech sound. Speech sounds come first. We are aware of them and then we park the graphemes into them, which is why explicit teaching and spelling is easily as helpful for reading as just teaching and reading is. Mm, totally. Mm. Um, something else you mentioned earlier was um, that you, I, I, I don't remember your exact wording around this, but you talked about, um, I think what you were saying was the importance of we need to know, or we now know um, what happens when children read well. And we also know what happens when they don't read well. Yes. Uh, when I now with my, I'm going to say newfound knowledge over the last few years, um, I understand those two things, what happens when they're reading well and what happens when they don't read well. But when I look at the hourglass, Carol, I find that a really beautiful visual representation to be considering that it might be able to help me to understand or to consider what's going on in terms of identification when children don't read well. Sure. So um, yes, one big idea that the hourglass can help conceptualize is not all poor readers are the same. Mm. And that's one thing that sometimes we, we think we can put all the yellow summerist children in a group and give them the same program or approach or the all red at-risk children in the same group yet again and try to give them the same program and approach. And the reason why they might have slight risks or serious risks could differ. For instance, 
in our Broca's area where we, we hardwire the memory trace for the 44 phonemes and the ability to manipulate and be aware of them, there may be a breakdown here. And that's a very common breakdown that we might consider to be dyslexia, right? And you can have that from, um, a, there can be a genetic connection. Um, there's a strong genetic component to that. It could be that there's dystichia. You've never really been taught and the hard wiring for Broca, Broca's area is not automatically wiring it. It doesn't intuit it necessarily um, in all people. So because of that, you can have difficulties up here. Conversely, there could be difficulties down in this bluish area when we start talking about your phonemic awareness may be accurate enough for reading and spelling process, but it may be that you're having a hard time connecting these graph beams, mm. and letter patterns, because this is these are in distinctly different places in our brain. If I go, after, yeah, if I go here for just a heartbeat, the top sure. part of the hourglass is right here. Right in our pronunciation articulation, we say Paul Broca discovered that area as a speech and language pathologist. The back area, your occipital lobe back here is where letter and letter patterns are visually seen. And the angular gyrus with this phoneme grapheme analysis is the connection between those. So this is the top part of the hourglass to through the bottleneck to the back part of the hourglass. And children can hey, Carol, have- can, I'm sorry, can I, just, I, can I just stop you and see what you're oh, looking at? Because I'm wondering if your screen is different from ours. So we're seeing the hourglass. Oh, we are, then we are seeing something different. Thank do you just you. want to see if you can switch your, because I'm really, thinking you're just sure. taking us through a beautiful little explanation of those parts of the brain <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and layering the hourglass on, which is perfect. So I, we'll just um, see if you can. Perfect. Here we go. Can you see your brain there? Yes, we can see a brain there. Good, good. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. Okay, good to know. So I'll make that even a little bigger here. Oops. Except now I want you to see it over there. Um, all right. I'm going to end my show and just leave it right where it was if you could see that. So since we can, can see that just fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So so what I was suggesting is that this is the left hemisphere of a good reader's brain and mm -hmm. all readers, good readers use the same areas of the brain in order to learn to read and to spell. Um, Sorry, can I just, can I just please have you say that one more time? Because that's a beautiful Carol Tolman quote for everybody to take forward into the start of their teaching year. Okay, so all readers use the same portion in the portions in the brain and communicate those inter interconnectedly in order to read and to spell, right? So um, when people say, well, this student doesn't learn that way or there's a, there's a problem here, you know, in a certain area, they just can't, they have to do like sight words because they can't, you know, like automatic, automatically memorize words visually because they just can't do that sound stuff. That doesn't work. It's not an efficient, mm. effective way in which to read. However, we know how to intervene to help support children that have problems in one or more of these areas. So I was showing Carla that this top part here with pronunciation and articulation is the top part of the hourglass. When I think of that big, big to small the units of sound, the speech sound system. And this section back here in the occipital lobe is the area of the brain where we visually look at the letters and the letter patterns on the page. And the connections between those, this is the more like the top part pulling that information through what we call an angular gyrus, the phoneme grapheme analysis association, back toward the back part of our brain. As beginning readers, we are laboriously going front to back, front to back, activating chemically, right? Those neurons and they're firing in order to try to make memory traces. The more we have done that with, with um, you know, a larger bank of words from easier to more complex patterns with systematic, explicit, structured instruction, the more we become automatic with it. And then those words become as if by sight automatized. We no longer have to read by going ah, t, cat. We can look at a word and go, oh, cat. And then immediately lots of images conjure up, you know, are conjured up of your tabby cat that you have, um, that you love and have had since a child, right? The meanings of, of that. So I think of the hourglass around the brain. And then I was showing, and maybe this did not show either, um, the idea that that of course, when we are up on the top part, which is more associated with Broca's area, and then the bottom part, which is associated with all three, Broca and the angular gyrus and your occipital lobe, 
those areas can be activated as soon as you are aware of an individual phoneme and you know the name of the letter, you can start connecting those two together. And I think that's sometimes a misunderstanding, Carla, that some people think, oh, we have to do all this phonemic awareness and get it all done. And then we have to get, then, then you start on phonics and spelling. But as soon as you are aware of a phoneme and you know it's more, more common letter correspondence, that's when you can start putting those together. And you mm -hmm. would say things like, you would not say B says B because that's treating it like a print to speech, but you could say B is represented with the letter B, right? So when I wanna spell B, the sound B in a word, I'm probably gonna use the letter B. And that's the, the proper way to articulate those ideas because of, of speech to print system in our brains. Mm. That's great. How, how would you recommend for those, um, or how have you experienced that schools or um, classroom teachers or educators or school leaders have used um, the hourglass to help build knowledge and practice in their um, places? Oh, sure. Thanks. So um, there's lots of ways that you can do this. I'm a big person, uh, you know, big supporter of visuals to help represent really complex constructs. And of course, there's a danger in that, right? In that if you take something that's very complex and minimize it a little too much, then it's not representing the full research. And I'm very, very cognizant and careful about that. But I would say, for instance, here's one way. It's kind of fun that you, this is another slide here that I've created mm -hmm. um, that you ask. So there are assessments that look at various areas um, and screen students and also progress monitor children about these top and bottom part um, skills for word work. So David Kilpatrick's past fits right in here on the top. So you can see that you could find where children fall um, on this progression by utilizing the past. In addition, if you use something, like I'm not sure in New Zealand if, if you've heard or used things like Acadians or Dibbles or Amesweb, if those are familiar to you, Carla. Um, but if, but what, if not- what, Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, yes, we many, Many are familiar. Um, we, we have a real mix of um, assessments and the observation that I've made and was my own experience as a school principal um, due to the fact that we were not um, as aware as potentially what we should have been or could be of the importance of those foundation skills and phonological awareness and alphabetic principle. Uh, we don't always um, one, have the knowledge that, of the importance to look for um, appropriate diagnostic tools in those areas. And so when you think about, like we sort of go from building blocks from phonological awareness to alphabetic principle, fluency, vocab, comprehension, when we look from that perspective, in New Zealand, historically, we've come in at fluency and we haven't understood about those foundation layers. So what we're observing across the country, Carol, with um, an increased knowledge and aware, awareness and knowledge of the science of reading and the implications of those um, irrefutable findings is that more and more people are becoming aware of the various diagnostic tools that are available, the importance of using those, and then they're beginning to look at how do we bring that in and, and sort of rewrite our systems and processes um, to be able to put that into practice. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, so with that beginning um, understanding of digging down and go, you know, starting from, well, the student is not fluent. Well, the question would be why, like what mm -hmm. area or areas in the brain, because there's no one place for a good reading, you know, for good reading to be processed within your brain. So what area or areas are at, at risk? Um, and we teach all of them. And then also keep your assessments moving so that you can find out where they're not responding and provide more support. But it would be, it would look like, well, there are tools that you can use to see whether or not children are able to in individually identify beginning sounds, initial sound fluency or first sound fluency with some onset rhyme activities, as I mentioned earlier. There are also activities that where you're asking students to tap, tap, tap to segment sounds. Um, and can they blend sounds, but can they pull those apart? And then the question then becomes at what levels? Like we said before, you know, CVC is not everything, right? We need to move to bigger and bigger phonics sections as we are aware of sounds. So blends in the beginning, 
blends in the end, blends in the beginning and the end, so on and so forth. The bottleneck here is found beautifully by letter naming. If you give children lowercase and uppercase letters and ask them to name them for you, and then also you could ask them to tell you the most commonly associated sound that they think of for those letters, um, you're in the bottleneck here where you're using the sounds and the symbols together, all three of those areas from Broca's area through the angular gyrus back into the occipital lobe. That's the beginning of the alphabet. Mm. And you know, the bottom part is, is also important regardless of what's happening on the top, whether that's strong or weak, you could use a phonics screener um, and or a spelling inventory as a window into the children's understanding of the speech system and an understanding of the orthography, the letter and letter patterns um, of our language and morphology as well, whether they're spelling um, and able to read them. And for a spelling inventory, you want it to go from simple to more complex, mm. much like you see on the bottom part, right, of the hourglass. For a phonic screener, you want to include the same progression, simple to complex. However, you also want nonsense words included there. And the reason you do is that there are students who are have made a memory trace as if by sight for certain mm. words they see a lot. So they can trick you, right? Dyslexics can trick you, right? Into, th into looking on assessments like they know a lot about the phonics system. However, if you put a nonsense word of the same pattern in front of them, they've never seen it before. And that helps you know whether they can look at letter and letter patterns in a progression they've not seen and sound it out as it is. So they may be able to read a word like sit or cat or up, but then they see something like L-U-T and they can't decode it. Mm. That tells you that there's still an underlying issue. And, and the question would be, there may be an issue down here in the bottom part, there could also be a weakness up here in the, in the phonemic awareness that you have to search for too in your, in your mm. assessment. Mm. That's a really um, thorough explanation. Thank you for that. What I'd like to do now is just ask those people who, are, um, who have joined us uh, this morning, if you have a question for Carol, could you just please pop it in the comment thread now? I will um, jump in and see um, if we do have any questions, Carol. And um, then I would love for you to just jump into telling us potentially um, a little bit about your involvement with letters and maybe um, what you've learned through the execution of that process of, of bringing that to fruition and the benefits that that's having across the world. Sure, sure. So, um, well, letters, I feel is like my third child. So, um, <laughs> like Keegan and, and letters, and, and I fondly um, have experienced letters with Dr. Louisa Motes, who is the lead author in letters since its inception. So, um, the passion around knowing what you need to know in, as a teacher in order to be smarter than your programs and to teach children, right, and know which programs to utilize and adjust and respond to your children's errors in an appropriate way to move them forward is really the passion behind letters. For me, um, I didn't learn what I needed to learn in my bachelor's work. I didn't learn what I needed to know in my master's work. Mm. It was accidentally um, through my doctoral work that I finally stum you know, I finally found what it was that I needed to know. And I'll suggest, you know, Carla, this might be um, helpful for people. IDA, the International Dyslexia Association, has a very thorough list of knowledge and practice standards. You can get that right off the IDA website. Mm. I would take that if I were an educator at this point and rate yourself just, just you know, confidentially, right? You could say, oh yeah, I know a lot about this. I've read a lot about this. I represented this in my curriculum, check plus. Or hmm, yeah, I know about this, but maybe I could learn a little bit more, that's a check. Or, oh my goodness, I've never heard about this aspect of literacy. That would be, you know, a delta or, you know, a triangle or a negative, whichever. But then that would guide you into your own personal studies um, about what you wanted to find out about. And that happened for me. I knew a bit about the bottom portion. I didn't understand the top portion quite yet. I've not, I'm not a speech and language pathologist. I wish I, I in another life I will be, um, but <laughs> um, it, it helps guide me. And that's what letters really is. Letters is, is um, trying to educate teachers for all aspects of language, not only the hourglass type of aspect, but also, well, if you, have you talked about Hollis Scarborough's rope ever? Um, and is that familiar to people, Carla? 
Oops, sorry, I'm just going to change my bit. Yes, very much so. Yes, Good. it is. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so letters would represent all strands of the rote model as well as the writing, as writing, you know, written expression. And it's our way to say, you know, we can't wait for higher education to get in line. We have kids that need to be taught. We have teachers that need to know what to teach and what materials to purchase and how to adjust things when they don't work well for certain children. So we wanted to get that out there now and hopefully... You know, the hope is letters has been used in some higher ed situations. That's great because pre-service is where we should be learning this. Um, but of course, we have we have um, large scale initiatives all throughout our country and the world just to make sure that teachers know what they need to know to be well prepared. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, just from the short time we've been chatting this morning, what's really obvious is our shared belief around the absolute crucial nature of increasing teacher knowledge and, and the implications that, ha that that has for teacher practice. And that if we can um, invest in building teacher knowledge and practice, then it is, um, pardon the pun, a no-brainer that we will, in fact, reach so many more children in terms of success rates and increasing student outcomes. So That's right. it's, it's been amazing to chat with you this morning, Carol. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us about the Tolman Hourglass figure before we um, sum up? Well, I guess I would I would just say that um, if you're wondering where you could be in the, in the scope and sequence of phonological um, instruction or phonics and spelling, then think about looking at a explicit scope and sequence similar to what you see in the top and the bottom part of the hourglass. And um, one of the things that's important is rather than teaching these skills haphazardly like or incidentally by finding them in a text when students make mistakes, you would want to purposely step back and have an explicit scope and sequence that you're following to teach from directly. Mm. And of course, mm. errors, you can error correct as they go, but you want independent of, of their mistakes, a very tight scope and sequence that you're following so that all these skills are covered very thoroughly. Mm. And, and one thing that I would love to add to that too, Carol, is the importance of taking a, a preventive um, approach to that. I feel that when I reflect on my experience as a classroom teacher, it was very much a reactive approach that I took due to my lack of knowledge and, and um, evidence-based practice. And so it was always that sort of ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Whereas what we're observing and we're part of implementing now across the country is support for teachers and schools to do exactly what you've just said. And, and to be able to implement a scope and sequence that teachers are able to take a systematic and step-by-step -step approach and really ensure that reading isn't left to chance. Right, that's right. It's just too important. It, just mm, it really important. is. It caps you for life if you don't, if you're not a strong reader and writer and your, your opportunities are limitless when you do have those skills in place. It's super mm. important. Mm. Thank you so much for your time, Carol. It has been amazing. There's lots of amazing um, thank yous already that people have popped in, in into the comment thread. It's been wonderful to develop a little bit more understanding of uh, how you've taken um, the work of many people and interpret it into this really, really clear picture being um, the Tom and Hourglass figure and the way that you are able to articulate so succinctly how this is then able to be transferred onto um, that left hemisphere of the brain and um, talk about um, the fact that, you know, reading, true reading um, is through the development of a reading network uh, has been incredibly beneficial. I feel like this is such a great chit chat to start the year off because we're on holiday at the moment in terms of our teachers, but um, we're all able to go into this new schooling year with this message, with all of these key messages from you and, and to be able to reset. And often we will be out in school saying um, much of what you're saying, but for them to hear this and see it in another way is so, so incredibly important. So from all of the teachers and the leaders and the parents, we have a lot of parents um, of dyslexic children in particular who are working hard to increase their knowledge. 
I'd really, really like to thank you for your time today um, and your commitment to, to the cause of ensuring that um, globally the science of reading is hitting um, classroom floors, where I'm sure you'll agree will make the biggest difference. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I share your passion. I feel that from you and your group, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to join you. Yes. Thank you, Carol. Will you? My way too. Okay, Carla. <laughs> Send some Thank warmth. you so much. <laughs> Take good care. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do that.